Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to 81st Media Group Exchange session. This week, we have Howden Yang from MIT here with us to speak about his work on model performance attribution to changes in underlying data distribution. Howden is a second year PhD student at the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab at MIT. He is advised by Dr. Marcel Zemi. His research interests include methods to construct fair and robust machine learning models, which maintain their performance across real-world distribution shifts, with a particular focus on applications of such models for uh, healthcare. His research has appeared in top venues such as Nature Medicine, NeurIPS, and ICMR. So thank you very much, uh, Howran, for joining us today. But before we start, uh, how would you like to take questions? Uh, can we interrupt you, or do you have designated breaks in your talk for questions? Uh, feel free to interrupt. Oh, thank you. So as always, everyone, let's try to make this session as interactive as possible. And now, without further ado, let me hand it over to Howran. Cool. All right. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you for having me here today to talk about our paper, uh, Why Did the Model Fail? Achieving Model Performance Changes to Distribution Shifts, which will appear at ICML in July. Uh, this is joint work with Harvini Singh, Marzi Kasemi, and Shamni Joshi. So machine learning models often fail in new domains. In the, in the clinical setting, one really famous example is this Epic sepsis model. So Epic uh, is a large EHR database software company. And in around 2017, they developed this model, proprietary model, to predict sepsis risk for patients in the ICU. Now, a few years later, this paper was published by some folks at U Michigan, finding that the model performs much poorly uh, than Epic reported. So Epic reported that their model would perform around 0.8 uh, EUROC. Whereas on the U Michigan data, they found that the performance was 0.63. So if, if you're uh, a practitioner working with this big uh, company on the proprietary model, you might ask, why did the model fail? Similarly, models also fail over time. So this is a uh, paper from Marcy's lab uh, where they looked at performance of a mortality prediction model in MIMIC3. So here we're training a model on data from 2001, 2002 to predict mortality. And if you deploy this model over time, we see that there is first a slow drop uh, in performance as we go along, but then there is a massive drop in performance as we have uh, the shift in the EHR records from curve view to meta vision, which changes what other concepts in the EHR mean. So you can imagine that this type of temporal degradation happens a lot in deployed clinical models. And if you're working with a deployed clinical model, you might ask yourself, why did the model fail? And finally, this is some work that I was involved in in Nature Medicine, where we trained a model on x-rays to predict underdiagnosis. Uh, so underdiagnosis here uh, corresponds to uh, the false positive rate if a model that's trained to predict no finding. So false positive means we predict no finding uh, when the person actually has a finding, which is very bad because that can result in withholding of treatment. So here, uh, one of many results we find is that uh, this you know, deep convolutional neural network model has much higher and diagnosis, aka false positive rate for females, younger patients, black and Hispanic patients, and then patients that are medicated. So again, if you're training this model, you might ask yourself, why did the model fail on certain subpopulations and how can we fix it? So we've seen all these examples of clinical machine learning models failing under distribution shift. For example, in a new domain over time or for certain subpopulations. In this paper, we present a method to explain why this happens. Why does a model fail under distribution shift, either these distribution shifts or other types of distribution shifts? Okay, so why is such a method useful and how would it be sort of used in your model deployment monitoring? So here's how I imagine envision it being used. Uh, let's say we have some trained model. This might be a normal empirical risk minimization model. It might be uh, some robust trained model or any other model. And then you're monitoring it continuously for, for performance drops. Maybe you're deploying this model in a new domain or just monitoring it over time. Eventually, you see some performance drops, and then you decide to take action. And by doing so, you use our method to generate some explanation of what the performance drop uh, happens and why it occurred. This explanation ideally uh, would inform you of some mitigating action that you can take, and this mitigating action goes back to fix the model. Okay, so immediately we see that. Uh, the explanation is useful to the extent for which it can inform downstream mitigating actions. And two, we see that this method is not a detector of whether performance did drop. That's your monitoring part, right? We do not have any statistical tests in our method to detect whether performance drops, but here we assume that performance has dropped, and then our method can generate explanation 
that can be used to take downstream actions. So what are some of these making actions? Well, there's many, many actions out there in the prior literature. Uh, the simplest one may be just some sort of data collection. So you can have additional targeted data collection, either from the source or the target domains. So the source is where you train your model, target is where you're trying to deploy your model. You might have some sort of targeted data augmentation or domain adaptation, or even fancier methods like test time augmentation or model editing, which Tom talked about a couple of weeks ago. So there's many such making actions. Ideally, uh, we would some, want some uh, properties that the method should have. So first, this explanation method here should be model agnostic. So it should be agnostic to both the architecture, so it should work for a convolutional neural network, a recurrent neural network, or even an XG boost model. It should also be agnostic to the training method. So in that sense, our method is complementary to how the model was trained. You can, uh, you can diagnose a failing model that's trained with ERM or IRM or group DRO or any other robust training method. Second, the method should be modality agnostic. So this method should work if your data is time series or tabular or x-rays, examples which we saw earlier. Third, this explanation is only useful to the extent for which it can inform downstream mitigating actions. So ideally, this is compatible with a wide range of downstream mitigating actions. And finally, we want the method to be precise. And precise, I mean very broadly here as more than just you know, the shifts in PFX or shifts in PFY given X or shifts in PFY. We want sort of a targeted uh, shift identification of what has shifted, which will allow us again to make better mitigating actions. Okay, so now we see that such a method may be useful in the real world for deployed models. The next question is, uh, what is explanation, right? And there's many explanations out there. Perhaps you're familiar with methods like Lime, SHAP, GradCam, integrated gradients, so on and so forth. But this problem is very different from typical ML explanation methods. For one, these methods operate on a per sample basis, whereas we want something on like a per data set basis. Second, these are more about explaining how a model predicts, why a model predicts a certain label for a particular sample, whereas here we're uh, currently about attributing total changes in model performance overall. So the problem uh, is quite different from existing uh, sort of interpretability methods. Now there is a line of prior work that looks at detecting data partitions with low performance, uh, some of which are, are cited here. Uh, so essentially the purpose of, uh, of these works is to find examples, you know, hard examples in your data set, either ID or OD, which your model does poorly. Uh, and then ideally have some sort of clustering of the samples as well. I think this is a perfectly fine way to do the uh, explanation of uh, model failure, but here we propose a different form of explanation, distribution-based shift explanations. So in this setup, we have, uh, this is an example where we have some source domain, let's say hospital A, where we have 76% you know, accuracy of your model. And then we're deploying your method on, a, uh, your model on target domain, which has reduced accuracy of 13%. We propose an explanation that is an attribution of this form. So we attribute the performance drops to shifts in specific distributions. For example, one such distribution may be this one. And this is, this is a synthetic example uh, where uh, this notation means the distribution of heart rate given age changes between hospitals. So this might say, for example, older people have lower heart rate in the target domain than the source. And we put a number to this distribution, let's say minus 7%. So you know, I, vaguely this means that 7% of the drop of the 13% can be attributed to this. And let's say this is the most significant factor. We'll see what this number means uh, in a second once we get to the method. You might have some other, uh, some other distributions, for example, a distribution of the outcome given specific covariates maybe minus 4%. And I'll briefly note that uh, shifts can also increase performance. For example, maybe your model does really well on older people and you have more older people in the target domain. So here, maybe shifting the age distribution from source to target actually causes an increase in the performance, in which case we want a positive uh, attribution. So we want our attribution to be sign. And then the idea is that these numbers sum up to, to 13%. Okay. So this is the form of the attribution that we would like to have in our method. Uh, so there's some related work in terms of distribution-based uh, attributions. Uh, so one line of work simply looks at whether a distribution has shifted. So this is still quite far from attributing performance to those specific distributions. Instead, this can be used as part of that sort of monitoring process to see whether performance has dropped, uh, perhaps. 
There are also works that looking at that look at attributes that attribute shifts in the drawing distribution. That is, you know, PDF all your features in the label to some marginal distributions. But we argue that our problem is uh, highly non-trivial, even given these prior methods, since uh, there are several factors. So first, not all distribution shifts will affect model performance. You might uh, imagine a large shift in a feature, uh, but your model does not use that feature. And so shifting that feature as much as you, as you want would not change the model performance. So we would not want to attribute any, uh, any of the shift to that particular feature. And this is a more broader point, which is that the degree of the shift of each feature uh, may be very different to what one attribute to it. So you might have features that shift a little, uh, but change the performance a lot, or features that shift a lot, but change the performance not very much. Third, some distribution shifts may actually increase model performance, as we saw in the example earlier. And so we would want to assign uh, attribution, which is not possible given the power works shown here. Fourth, and this is more of a general point, which is that distribution shifts can combine nonlinearly. So if you have a shift in distribution A that increases performance 5% or decreases performance 5%, we have a shift in distribution B that decreases performance 10%. If those two happen at the same time, you will not necessarily have a minus 15% change in the performance. You might have minus 50% or even 0%. So distribution shifts combine highly nonlinearly and non additively. And finally, this is another uh, more subtle point, which is that shifts may happen in variables external to your model input that affect model performance. One example of this might be your model uh, does not necessarily use race as an input um, to predict some target variable, but when you deploy a new domain, the distribution of demographics changes. That change of demographics causes also some downstream changes in labs and vitals, et cetera, uh, that would cause changes in model performance. But the root cause of the shift was a change in the demographics. So we would like to attribute uh, the shifts to that particular shift. Okay, so now it's a good time uh, if there's any questions before we get to actual, the actual method. I can start with one. So sure. uh, the initial your uh, nature paper that you were showing some results yep. from, um, it's possible that all of the you know higher false false negative or false positive rates, uh, they are for the minority groups. Like the I'm assuming younger patients, you would have fewer younger pa patients, fewer Hispanic or Black patients, right? So do you think your uh, work of this distribution? shift is also somehow related to that bias against the minority group. Uh, do you ever, you know, uh, combine these two ideas? Like, yeah, okay, that the distribution shift. Uh, and so later on, we'll see an example where acquiring more data points from minority groups increases performance for the minority group. Uh, but I think the point is a bit more subtle in that uh, you might not always have performance in minority groups. Uh, you might just have higher noise and, and so on and so forth. But I think our method can sort of disentangle uh, whether acquiring samples from minority groups will be helpful to improving model performance, either for that group or overall. Okay, thank you. Um, I had a quick question as well. This is more of a maybe high level question. So if you want to answer it at the end, that's totally fine. So you mentioned that, you know, let's say the demographics changes and then that yeah. causes a change in like some of the um, inputs to the model that the, it has seen. So demographics is one thing that we can quantify, but what if there are like other changes that, that we don't know uh, is happening and that's actually the causal mechanism for some of the other yeah. changes? So How that's an assumption that we make later on and we'll get to that in a couple of slides. That's a really good question. <laughs> okay, sounds good, thanks. Cool, all right. So now we'll get to the method, which contains quite a bit of math. So if you don't like math, come back in 15 minutes where I'll talk about the experiments. So one thing that we need to talk about before we get to the actual method is this idea of Shapley values. So most of you might be familiar with Shapley values already. So I'll go through it fairly quickly. Shapley values is a result from probative game theory. The idea is that we have several players playing a game. Let's call them Alice, uh, Bob, and Charlie. They're playing some sort of game. And after playing the game, they get some total payoff. Let's say 20 points. Okay, as defined by some value function. Now the value function can take in any power set of the set of players. So you might be interested in what happens if only Alice plays the game? What's her payoff? If Alice and Bob plays the game, what's the payoff? The value function allows us to answer that question. So the value function takes in any coalition, which is a subset of the players, and then returns the payoff if that set of players were to play the game. Now, uh, the Shapley value, which is a result from the 1980s in economics, is how do we attribute this total payoff, this value of 
everyone who's playing the game to each player. For example, if Alice plays the game by herself, she might not get very high payout, but if she plays the game with other people, she can improve performance of, she can improve the payout when uh, combined with other players. So the idea of attributing this total payoff to each of the players is highly related to the question is of how much value does a player add when they join a coalition? Again, coalition is any subset of the players. So if you want to care about how much value Alice adds, you would look at, for example, uh, how much value does Alice get on her own? How much value does Alice get when we add her to the game with Bob? How much value does Alice add when we add to the game with Charlie? And so on and so forth. So here's the setup again. And it turns out that the result uh, of what this attribution should be is this long equation here. So we'll skip over all the, all the normalizing terms, which are this term and this term. Let's just look over what this summation is doing. For a particular player D, let's say Alice, we're going to sum over all the possible coalitions that she can join. So this includes the null set, includes uh, the set containing every other player, contains you know the power set essentially of the set of players. And then we're going to look at what happens when we add Alice to the coalition. How much does the value increase? And then we're going to subtract from the value of that baseline coalition. So this is essentially looking at of all of the possible coalitions that Alice can join, how much value does she add sort of on average in hybrid? Now, why would you want to use this you know, complex equation to uh, do the attribution? Well, it turns out that this is the only assignment, the only attribution that satisfies four nice properties. And I won't say what these properties are because I'll give them for, my, uh, for our specific method later on. So uh, essentially that's uh, what Shopee values is, two quick addendums. One is that by the first of the Shop method, the Shop method is one uh, application of Shopee values to a per simple explanation where the value function uh, is how much uh, the, which the value function is the model uh, prediction output minus some baseline and the players are each of the features. So we can adapt uh, our particular problem to shopping values by formulating what the players are, what the value functions are and using this uh, equation to compute uh, the shopping values. Now, uh, you might notice that this summation involves essentially a exponential number of uh, computations of the value function. So we're summing over exponentially many possible coalitions. So we're gonna call our, our value function many, many times. There's approximation methods out there uh, that allow us to uh, essentially reduce the number of positive value function by, by approximating using some model that we train. And we use these approximation methods in our calculation as well. Uh, but for now, just assume that we're doing the exact computation. So this uh, result from game theory seems completely out of the loop, right? How is this relevant at all to the method or to the problem distribution shift attribution. We'll come back to this in a second. The first, let's think about this other problem, which is what distributions should we consider? Previously we saw, you know, heart rate given age or sepsis given blood pressure. Let's think about a really simple case where we have two features and a label. Now, uh, you know, you might consider, for example, all marginal distributions, shifts in X1, X2, or Y. You might consider uh, the classic decomposition of covariate shift, which is shifts in the covariates and then concept drift shifts in y given x. Or you might go crazy and consider all possible distributions, right? All possible marginal and conditional distributions in which there are way too many to list here. So it's clear that if you want to sort of have a, a granular and precise uh, attribution, considering all distributions is not a valid strategy because there are exponentially many such distributions as we increase the size of the uh, variable set. In our paper, we argue for uh, the set of distributions to consider to be the set of causal mechanisms. So here we assume that you have a causal graph, okay? And such a graph can be constructed through domain knowledge or from positive discovery methods. And we also test uh, sort of what happens when the graph is misspecified as well in the paper. But let's assume that we have a causal graph for how X1, X2, and Y are generated. This uh, implies a natural breakdown of the distributions, which are the mechanisms. So here X1 is generated on its own, X2 is generated based on X1, and then y is generated based on x2 and x1. So this gives us a manageable set of distributions to consider. And there's also some nice properties. Uh, so let's say, again, we know this causal graph with this set of candidate distribution shifts. And then we want to attribute our performance job to. Um, so first, uh, this is a succinct uh, attribution or a succinct uh, set of distributions in the sense that imagine you have a shift in x1. 
if you have the all marginals uh, set distributions, that would cause a shift in X2 and Y, because these are also shifting if you shift only PFX1 in the marginals. So in that case, you would have an attribution that has three significant terms. If you use the causal graph um, based approach, this uh, mechanism does not shift if you only shift PFX1, and neither does this one. So in that case, you would have a succinct explanation containing only shifts in X1. And we argue that such shifts are also interpretable and actionable because first, you could construct these causal graphs with domain knowledge. And second, uh, these shifts may represent real things in nature that you can go in and probe. But as with all you know, causal papers, we have to make some assumptions. So first, we assume that you know, the, the causal graph is known and it's factorized and all variables in the system are observed. So there are no hidden confounders. Okay. And second, we assume that uh, the mechanisms in the graph are allowed to shift independently and the distribution shift of interest are sort of sums of independent shifts that occur in each of the mechanisms. Okay, so again, the setup is we have this uh, causal graph, which implies some candidate distribution shifts. And then we observe some data, some finite data set from the source, as well as some finite data set from the target. We observe some loss L on the source, and we observe some higher loss on the target. And we would like to attribute this delta value to each of these three shifts. Okay, what about in a very simple case where let's say, you know, these two mechanisms shift and this one does not. So the source distribution of X1 is different than target distribution of X1, but, uh, and same with this one, but this one does not change. Well, in that case, we would want to attribute, you know, some delta one to, um, to the distribution of X1, delta two to the uh, mechanism of X2 given X1 and then zero to the other one in a way such that these two sum up to the actual shift. So this is a formalization of what we saw earlier where the summing of the attributions sum up to the total change in performance. Okay, any questions so far? Uh, quick question on the method. Yeah. So do you basically compute this um, source distribution of X1 and target distribution of X1 like empirically, like from the data set, or do you actually like, um, like make some assumptions on, on what, what needs to be and so on? So we don't compute uh, them explicitly. Okay. Uh, but we do have a way of attributing it to the design of computer explicitly that we'll see in a second. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Uh, so now <laughs> uh, some more math. Uh, so there's a lot of notation here, unfortunately. Uh, so the left column is what the notation is. And the right column is an example for the problem, the simple graph that we saw earlier. So we have some system variables V. Okay. And previously we saw V was X1, X2, and Y. Now we don't, we call these Simpson variables because we don't really care what features your model use. Your model might use X1 to predict Y or X2 to predict Y or some other combination. We have some loss function that operates on a per sample basis. So your loss function takes in some system variable values as well as some model uh, plus a real number. For example, the squared error. We have some data set. Uh, and here we're concerned with the source data set and the target data set for which we have finite samples from. And then we have the performance measure, which is the expectation uh, of the loss function for the samples we have in the data set. So you might uh, care about performance on the source or performance on the target. And here we're, where you care about attributing the distribution shifts to the differences between these two. Okay. Uh, now, previously we talked about the mechanisms and the mechanisms in the color graph are simply for each node, we have that node given its parents. So we saw, you know, D of X1, D of uh, X2 given X1 and so on and so forth. So these mechanisms are not distributions because we have distribution for the single source and distribution for the single target. They're just mechanisms in space. And then we have the set of candidate shifts. So we saw before that the candidate shifts are the set of all mechanisms, which are the set, you know, all of the uh, mechanisms in the causal graph. So it's a set of all variables given its parents. So previously we saw, for example, there were three candidate shifts. And finally, we can define a concrete distribution by looking at uh, the mechanism value in the source. So this, for example, would be uh, the probability distribution of X2 given X1 and you're in the source domain. Okay, so the goal again is to attribute this difference to each of the distributions in your candidate set. How can we do this? Well, we use Shafi values. 
Okay, so we talked about this uh, a few slides ago, and so it formulate our problem as a Shapley values problem. We formulate it as a game. So here, the players of the game are the candidate shifts. Okay, so here we have uh, the set of players, and now we're coalition against any any possible subset of the players. Now, this is kind of an intricate point, which is that when a player is in the game, it contributes its target distribution. If a player is not in the coalition, it contributes its source distribution. We'll see an example of this later on, but essentially for any coalition that we have defined here, this implies a distribution over the joint. Okay, so uh, essentially for any coalition, we have a distribution where if the mechanism I is in the coalition, it contributes its target distribution, Otherwise, it contributes a source distribution. And this gives a neutral distribution over our system variables. Here's an example. Let's say we have this simple causal graph again. We have some loss and loss plus delta. And in the source domain, we can factorize the distribution, the joint distribution as simply x1 source, x2 given x1 source, y given x1, x2 source, right? Suppose we have a coalition consisting of dfx1, so the mechanism x1. Now, um, we have this new joint distribution for this particular uh, coalition consisting of uh, the distribution where the uh, X1 is replaced with the target and the rest remain the source. Similarly, um, we have, uh, if the coalition consists of, of these two mechanisms, we have a new joint distribution that uh, consists of these three terms. So this is asking what happens to our joint distribution if some of the mechanisms shift or some of them do not. And the ones that shift, are those that are in our candidate, uh, our coalition. Okay, so back to this coalition distribution. Uh, our value function is then simply, how much worse does the performance get if only the subset of, uh, of the distribution shift? So if, you know, uh, dfx1 were to take its target value, what is uh, the difference in performance, drop in performance? And our total payoff, which is what happens when all of the distributions shift, that's simply the performance of the target minus performance of the source, right? That's if all of the mechanisms were to take its target value. So there's one problem though, which is we need to be able to compute performance on an arbitrary joint distribution. Now we know we can compute this for the source and target given finite samples. So that's just evaluating what the, the expectation is uh, given finite samples, but we cannot compute uh, very easily what the performance is on arbitrary distribution of source and target. So to solve this problem, we use importance sampling or importance weighting. Okay, so we make the classic assumption that there's some overlap in the support of each of the mechanisms. And then uh, I'll skip over uh, some of the math, but essentially uh, this involves uh, reweighting your source to make it look like the target or to look, make it look like the coalition distribution that you're interested in and to do this, we use probabilistic classifiers. So th this involves training models to predict whether uh, you're in the domain, in the source domain, and the target domain, given some subset of the features. So it turns out that uh, you have to train roughly two classifiers for each cause of the mechanism, which involves predicting whether um, you're in the source domain, given uh, your particular value, and then whether in the source domain, given uh, the parents and the particular value. Okay, uh, so the algorithm uh, very informally is as follows. We're given some finite samples and model, um, some metric, uh, and then the causal graph. First, we compute what the set of possible mechanisms are. And again, these are just the mechanisms of the causal graph. Then we split the data sets into train volume tests, each of these two data sets. And then we train these domain classifiers. Okay, so for each uh, candidate shift, we're training a domain classifier given the parents of the value, and then given your value, and then the parents of the node. We use the validation set for model selection. And then on the test set, we we'll compute the Shapley values. And to compute the Shapley values, we use the, you know, the value, the equation that we saw earlier, where the value function is the performance. And again, to compute performance of an arbitrary coalition distribution, we use the importance weighting that we saw earlier, which uses these classifiers that we trained already. Does that make sense? Yes, cool. yes. So why did we go through this whole procedure of using Shapley values? Why would you ever want to do this? Well, it turns out that with Shapley values, you get some very nice properties. So these are what I didn't mention before, which are the properties of the method, which we get directly from using Shapley values. First, we can guarantee, uh, assuming there's no estimation error, 
that the summing of the attributions sum up to the total shift. So the sum of the attributions that we attribute to each mechanism sums to the actual shift between the two domains. Second, we can guarantee that if a distribution does not shift, then its attribution will be zero. Third, we can guarantee that if we have a mechanism D and adding D to every other coalition does not change the performance of that coalition, then also we attribute D to be zero. So even if a mechanism, if a mechanism does shift, but it doesn't shift in a way that affects the model performance, we also attribute zero to that value. And finally, uh, we get this symmetry property, which is that you can swap uh, sort of what D1 and D2 is, you can swap source and target, and then all of your attributions will be inverted. So the sign will be flipped, which I think makes sense intuitively. I'll skip over this in a little example for the sake of time uh, and get to the experiments. So in the paper, we test a variety of synthetic, semi-synthetic, and real data sets. Now, the, uh, so with, with synthetic and semi data sets, we know what the ground truth shift is because that's how we protect the data set. So for these three data sets, we know how our attributions should look. Okay, and then we can confirm the correctness of our, our method on these data sets. For these two data sets, these are reward data sets where we don't necessarily how the distribution actually shifted. Uh, and so for these, we validate the, the sort of utility of our, um, of our method to give uh, mitigating actions. And we'll see, uh, an example uh, on the colored endless data set, which is a famous Spurs coalition data set, sort of as a warm up slash proof of concept. And then we'll go through a, a more detailed uh, explanation or a walkthrough of our method on a uh, mortality prediction task in the ICU. So there's a few more things in the paper that I haven't mentioned and won't be mentioned in the talk. Uh, one of which is we analyze the convergence rates of those attributions as we increase the number of samples, both theoretically and empirically. Second, we do experiments on what happens if the graph is misspecified. So we assume that the causal graph is correct. But what happens if you have a misspecified causal graph? What happens to your attributions? And finally, uh, we compare against uh, some baselines from prior work. I can talk about this uh, as well after the presentation. Cool. So let's start with this very simple colored endless data set. OK, so this is a classic data set in spurious correlations where we're trying to predict the digit if the, uh, the, the label of an endless digit. And for simplicity, we uh, binarize the digit to be zero uh, to be zero if it's zero to four, and then um, one if it's uh, five to nine with some noise. Okay. Then we color each uh, digit based on the label, and the color is highly correlated with the label on the source distribution. Essentially, if you were to use only the color to predict the digit, you would have a very high performance. So you would have eighty-two uh, percent accuracy. Okay. But on the target domain, the color is no longer correlated with the digit. And so a model that relies on the color to make the prediction would have a performance drop. And what is that performance drop? Well, uh, this is uh, the performance of an year in model as we change uh, as we change this row value. So the black dotted line here is uh, what the actual performance difference is. And notice that this causal graph infer, uh, implies three different mechanisms. PFY, PFA given Y, and PFX given A comma Y. And these are the three mechanisms shown here. And the lines shown here are the attributions given by our method. Okay, so um, we see that we correctly attribute all of the shift to PFA given Y because we're changing row. And one mitigating action this might inform is simply using group DRO. So this is the robustness method uh, that uh, increases the uh, performance for combinations of A and Y. And by doing so, we now see that uh, we do not shift the performance as much at all because the scale here is very low and any changes in performance uh, with respect to zero is simply just random noise. Okay, so this is a very simple uh, example of a sort of applying our method to a simple image data set, uh, sort of a pr proof of concept uh, warm up. Now let's get to the meat of the uh, examples, which is the ESU mortality. Okay, and this uh, will be in the camera ready of the paper, the full version. So here's the step. Suppose that you're a practitioner training a model to predict in hospital mortality. You use uh, labs and vitals from hospitals in the Midwest US, which has this many samples. Okay, um, so this is labs and vitals from ICU data. And then we deploy, you deploy a model on hospitals in the Southern US, which has different distributions than Midwest, presumably. And you observe an increase in the prior score. So the prior score is simply the mean squared error for uh, for probabilistic classification. 
because this is highly imbalanced, we can, we can use accuracy. So here we use the bias score for simplicity. So you deploy your model, you run it for maybe a couple of months. If you get very few samples, 250 samples, uh, and then you notice the increase in the bias score for that many samples. So your performance on the source is uh, 0.04. Your performance on the target on the Southern US is 0 0.08. So your performance has dropped by 0.036 roughly. So if you're the practitioner uh, deploying this model, you might ask, why did the model fail? Okay, uh, so first you have to need to come up with a color graph. And um, there's many ways to come up with a color graph. In the paper, we use uh, this graph, which comes from um, this uh, prior work, which does causal discovery on the same data set. Um, and here I'll notice uh, that some of the nodes are not scalars. So for example, vitals, labs, and demographics are all vector valued nodes. So vitals here actually has five to 10 possible features included, and labs also has five to 10 features included. So this comes, uh, this is sort of one point that's interesting, which is when we're coming up with this causal graph, we can trade granularity for domain knowledge and vice versa. Uh, and so if you have a lot of domain knowledge, you can specify, for example, blood pressure causes changes in this lab. And uh, you, know, you can specify all the interconnected relationships between each value of the vitals and each value of the labs. Or you can use vector value nodes to reduce the granularity of your, uh, if your possible downstream explanation, but you also need less domain knowledge to specify this false graph than to specify you know, the hundreds of possible connections between blood pressure and sodium levels and other other stuff. Okay, uh, and so in some other experiments in our paper, we run these on image data sets where X uh, is an image, right? So X could be very high dimensional. Uh, it could be just uh, you know hundreds of features, but still one node in the color graph. Okay, so suppose that this is the granularity that the practitioner comes up with this causal graph, and then they run our method. And what does our method say? Well, first this causal graph implies uh, maybe you know, six or seven different mechanisms. They run our method and here's what they get. Okay, so first uh, we attribute you know, 0 0.012 of the increasing prior score to shifts in labs given age and demographics. We attribute 0 0.01 of the change to shifts in age and so on and so forth. Now, luckily it seems like there's not a lot of uh, concept drift at least in the data set we've observed so far. Okay, so how can we use this explanation to actually increase improved performance in the model? Well, why don't we start by tackling um, by tackling this guy right here, the shift in age. This should be simple. Right, suppose that we want to tackle uh, this shift in age. Uh, how can we do that? Well, first let's plot what the distribution looks like. So this, this is the distribution of age in the Midwest. This is the distribution of age in the South. What do we see? Well, we see that there's distinctly more older people in the South. Okay, so this informs some mitigating action, right? Why don't we just collect more data from older people uh, in, the, in the source? Okay, and why don't we do so in the target? Well, maybe uh, it's cheaper to collect in the source or maybe you've got more data because they've come in. So now you do some more data collection and uh, you've co collected your data in a way such that your new uh, distribution of age looks like this green dotted line. Okay, so now you've collected your data in a way such that the uh, age distribution matches more closely to the actual target. Now, what happens to the performance? Well, that's retraining a model on this, just only on this uh, source that's, uh, that's uh, been updated. So before the data collection, we saw these numbers for what the distribution shift is and the performance on the target. After we collect more data from the source, we get a decrease in the virus score here by maybe 10%. And we also get a much more stable model. So we get a much lower performance drop and better target set performance. Now, what about some really naive baselines? Let's say you never had access to our method and you just do you know, the typical naive thing, which is maybe first training a method on the 250 samples. This does pretty poorly because you don't have enough samples to train a good model. What if you train on both the source and the target without any data collection? Well, you still don't do as well as collecting more data. Okay, so here collecting more data from older people is distinctly a way that improves your target set performance. Uh, and you only need to do it to collect it on source. So this is the case where sort of our attribution informs some targeted making action to your data collection from the source, which improves target domain performance. Uh, now, one footnote is that since we did not actually have the ability to collect new data from hospitals, we synthetically created the shift in age by subsampling the source population. So in practice, this is what the distributions in source actually look like in the ICU, 
uh, but we created this synthetic shift by subsampling. Now let's tackle something more uh, complex then. Uh, so after you, uh, you run uh, this attribution of our new model for this uh, collection uh, data on the source, you attribute it, now it looks like this. So now, now age is no longer a significant uh, contributor, but we do have a bigger significant contributor, which is this guy right here now, the uh, distribution of vitals given age demographics. And this is quite complicated because vitals is multidimensional and so is demographics. Uh, so this is saying something like, for example, you know, you have higher blood pressure for older uh, males in the, uh, in the South and the Midwest or something like that. Okay, but let's say they're supposed to tackle, they want to tackle this uh, conditional converted distribution shift, right? How can they do that? Well, they might use some domain adaptation methods, methods in sort of supervised or unsupervised domain adaptation. And one very simple method is simply uh, sort of importance weighting. So what we're going to say is we're going to look at this distribution on each sample in the source and the target. We're going to upweigh samples for which this distribution for that particular sample looks more like the source than the target. Now, this is a very, very simple uh, domain adaptation method from uh, a very long ago, uh, but let's see if it works. Okay. And uh, I should mention that sort of the main contribution of the paper is the method itself, not necessarily trying the best uh, medication strategies or to benchmark medication strategies. So let's use this really simple uh, um, strategy and see if it works. And luckily, we also already have these uh, importance weighting, uh, method computer importance weighting by using the classifiers that we trained earlier to compute the estimations. Okay, so what we do is we uh, upweigh samples for which this distribution looks like a target in the source. Okay, so our old model has this performance. This is with the, the collection uh, integrated in. And then if we use a new reweighted model, uh, we see that we get a few percent increase on the target distribution and also a much more stable model as well. Okay, so here, you know, you don't get a huge increase like we saw earlier, but you're also not doing a ton of work. You're just reweighting symbols. You're not actually, you know, collecting any more data or anything like that. Okay, what about the naive baselines? Well, uh, if you train only on the target, you can get very bad performance because you don't have enough samples. And if you train both on the source and the target, you get, um, again, slightly better results, but not as good as using our targeted mitigating action to uh, sort of mitigate shifts in a specific conditional distribution. Okay, so again, we see that by uh, by using our performance distribution, we can get a targeted mitigating action, mitigating shifts in this distribution, which slightly improves target domain performance. Now, if you run uh, this attribution again on the new model, we still see that you know this is by far the most significant shift. Okay, so maybe you could use more advanced domain adaptation methods or could do more data collection. And that might still be a way to improve performance. But here we've identified that you know, this is a problem. This is what you should look at with further methods. Okay, so in terms of future work, uh, we want to do uh, more application of our method to clinical settings. I think one exciting uh, area is fairness in chest x-rays. This is coming back to the, uh, the example we gave at the beginning of the talk, where in a data set like Mimic, we have not only demographics, x-rays, and disease labels, but we can merge this back to mimic four and mimic notes to get labs, vitals, diagnoses, mortality, and all sorts of other stuff. So we can build a causal graph using a patient's labs and vitals. And then we can really figure out you know, what's causing that unfairness, that TPR or accuracy uh, gap either in mimic, mimic or even across distribution shifts. So that's something that we're currently working on right now. Uh, and also I think ideally there's sort of a better mapping a shift type to mitigating strategy. So we saw before that we tackled the uh, the marginal shift by data collection. We tackled the conditional shift by domain adaptation. Maybe some uh, other work looking at what types of mitigating strategies are best at uh, mitigating different types of shifts that we observe from our method. And finally, uh, I think the method can easily be adapted to other learning steps. So all of our existing steps are supervised learning uh, methods, uh, but uh, I think they can be easily adapted to sort of unsupervised or sort of supervised learning or even reinforcement learning. You just have to formulate your problem uh, as uh, your, your reward uh, or your loss as an expectation over individual sample wise rewards. Okay, so to conclude, we present a method to attribute model performance changes to uh, distribution shifts and causal mechanisms. Our paper can be found here, and there will be a better version, a camera ready version in a couple of weeks uh, on archive. Our code is available as a PIP installable package. 
here as well. And this is a link to the slides uh, for this presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Harun, for this very interesting talk. I think your uh, work aligns very closely with this, um, you know, goal of like, explainability of AI models. So if you can explain uh, performance drop, I think it's a huge uh, benefit to, you know, uh, the deployment of these AI models. So I can open the floor for questions if we have any from the audience. If not, then I can probably start with a question. Um, can we go back to how, how you're kind of generating these causal graphs? Is it always basically based on domain knowledge? And uh, you mentioned that you have in your paper some analysis on what happens if the causal graph has misspecification. So can you elaborate on that a little? First, like how do you make these graphs? Yeah. And then what happens if the graphs are wrong? Cool. So I think um, in terms of creating causal graph, it's kind of a, a complex art, I guess, uh, where you can use the causal discovery methods, but there's many limitations to causal discovery methods. So this graph comes uh, is adapted from a causal discovery based graph that's presented in this paper. Um, you can also use domain knowledge to construct causal graphs. Um, and really, uh, in terms of misspecification, uh, we tried a few different misspecified graphs in our paper. Uh, essentially, um, it depends on uh, the degree to which the attribution uh, is incorrect. Depends on how the actual distribution shift, as well as how misspecified graph is. So ideally, I think if you encode all of the distributions that you would like to investigate in a causal graph, uh, that will probably be fine in terms of how the attributions look. So I guess it doesn't necessarily have to be causal, it just sort of encodes the set of distribution shifts that you think could change or just interesting investigating. Uh, but we haven't done any theory work on sort of misspecification causal graphs, only empirical work. Okay. Uh, and when you say how wrong the graph is, like it's, I mean, it does, uh, did you s notice anything about, you know, if the, if the specification of the root um, variable is wrong, that is more important. And if anything that comes later in the, uh, in the cause of graph, maybe that is less important. Any, any observation to that, or it's, uh, there isn't really any uh, value to where the where the misspecification is in in your graph what level is the misspecification at that's a good question i don't think we've looked at sort of what level the misspecification is um, but we did experiment with a few misspecified graphs so first mm -hmm. you might consider you know using the all marginal graphs so this is okay. i guess everything's independent and we do see that uh, essentially as we saw before uh this leads to a very not sparse explanation mm. not succinct explanation we also tried uh, essentially a topological sort. So it's kind of like a fully explanatory graph. And again, we find there that you get a lot of sort of, you get sometimes a, a decent uh, estimation, but a lot of times you get a lot of noise and estimation error. Okay. Um, so I think maybe when you don't know anything about the graph, perhaps using some combination of, of those uh, fully connected or, or marginals will give you some reasonable, some reasonable, reasonable. Okay. And one other uh, question. Um, in your experiments, you mentioned a lot of imaging data sets, and you gave us one example. So in that image is as in like one one uh, variable or one feature. Uh, in any of your experiments, is like image of regions taken as features, or is it always like image is a feature, um, kind of one node in your causal graph, or is it like any of your experiments use any other formation? We have not. That would be very interesting to check. So in all of our experiments, the image is one node that contains, it's mm -hmm. a vector node with, you know, hundreds or thousands of features. Yeah. Um, but I think if you can formulate a causal graph given regions of the image, that would be very mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, and then uh, I'm interested to see how the method would perform there as well. That's, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, because I, I mean, we see a lot of work like that in sort of semantic understanding of, you know, image scenes. Uh, oh, so people keep you know creating those semantic regions. This region is there because of that region. So that might have something to do with your uh, causal graph as well. Yeah. So I think I think another possible uh, way to go forward is instead of using the raw uh, input, we can mm -hmm. use maybe some disentangled representation space where we can figure out you know this is a concept for a car, this is a concept for a man, yes, and then yes. go to the causal graph based off the uh, representation that space concept, instead of yeah. the raw features. Yeah. Yeah, or uh, something like region proposal type exactly. idea. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, any other questions if audience have? 
if not then we can thank our uh, presenter haran uh, thank you very much for this very interesting talk uh, nandita is recording this conversation and uh, she'll post it on youtube and we'll share a link with you and you feel free to share it with your colleagues and friends thank you Perfect. very much thank you very much that was fun thank you thank bye. you bye thanks haran